like your life is in danger, you may want to weigh the use of Tor higher than if you are just doing run-of-the-mill browsing. These kinds of things are, they, they require human judgment. And I'm, I'm not, that's not my, what, the service I'm providing. I'm just trying to provide the data that goes into those judgments. PrivacyTest.org is a website that collects data for each browser with the goal of revealing what browsers pass what privacy tests. There are a lot of questions around this service, how it works, how you use it, what the scope is, why it doesn't have certain tests, but it has others, as well as maybe some things regarding um, the person who manages it, whose name is Arthur Edelstein, which I'm bringing on today, and his relationship with Brave and previous browsers that he's worked on and why he built the tool in the first place. Such a great interview, and I think you guys are going to learn a lot about not just privacytest.org, but how browsers track you, what you can do to prevent that, which browsers are kind of pushing the envelope on this kind of protection, as well as what the future of privacy looks like on browsers. I learned a lot from this interview. I think a lot of you will as well. And uh, let's get right into it. I really wanted to probably iron this out because I think it's important for our audience and yourself and pretty much everyone involved here. But I wanted to ask, how did privacy tests come about, what's your history with the service? And also there's, I'm sure, a lot of discussion that people have seen surrounding your employment with Brave. So it's probably good to get some history here so I and others can understand any potential conflicts of interest as well as just your history with um, your your history. It's probably important for us to know. So I, I got into uh, digital privacy or web privacy in probably uh, 2014, which is when I started working on Tor Browser at the Tor Project. And so i that's when I started learning really about how web browsers work, how privacy uh, gets destroyed by web browsers, uh, and how, how all the technical aspects of privacy are, are dealt with. Uh, a few years into uh, being at Tor, I was thinking, you know, we're doing all this great work, but we don't really have a clear way of letting everybody else in the world know that Tor browser is doing something special and is really protecting uh, people's privacy really well. And I was th thinking, well, if we had a table <laughs> that just sort of showed like what we're doing and what other browsers are doing, that would help people to understand the, the, the contrast. So I wrote a little proposal. This was in 2018 um, at, at the time. And we sort of discussed, like, should we do it as Tor project? But that never happened. So I, just kind of as a hobby, I started putting together a table, which meant that I was building tests one by one that would allow us to check, for example, can a cookie be shared between two websites or does the browser stop you from doing that? That's something that Tor browser stops, but other browsers, some of them still allow that. So I worked on that kind of at a pretty low level as a, as a hobby project uh, for a few years. In the meantime, I moved to Mozilla. Uh, I was working as a product manager on Firefox. Um, and I used it a little bit just to uh, help other people in Mozilla understand like what I was talking about when I was saying, you know, we should try to introduce this privacy protection or that privacy protection. And I realized, you know, this really is helping people get a clearer picture because it's otherwise it's a very technical problem. Um, and so uh, I, I actually left Mozilla in uh, middle of 2021. So then I, I decided to take some time off and really work on this in earnest. So I, I spent you know a lot more time trying to polish it, make it into something presentable. Uh, and so in October of 2021 is when I first published the, the what I called issue one of privacy tests. So it had been kind of baking for about three years. Um, and so in issue one, I tested, uh, I think around eight or 10 browsers. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the set of tests was more limited than it is today. Um, but it got really quite a lot of positive feedback from folks. Um, and so, you know, I mostly engaged with people on Twitter, got lots of suggestions. Uh, people found a couple of bugs, which I fixed. Um, and then I worked actually over the next nine months or so adding tests, trying to make the, uh, the, the whole project more polished and uh, more comprehensive than it was in, initially. But at some point I needed to, you know, earn a living. Uh, so I uh, happened to be talking to folks at Brave and they, they suggested that, you know, I, I could consider applying there. So I started working at Brave in the middle of uh, last year, a, a little over a year ago. Uh, and then I, I disclosed on the website, I'm now working for Brave, but I'm going to keep running this website independently, which means that um, Brave is not going to tell me what to do on the website. They're not going to say, you know, you have to change this or that. 
and I, I actually had that put into my contract as well, where I, I said, you know, note, I'm running this project independently uh, and it's going to stay independent. Basically brings us up to today. I've been continuing to maintain it. I publish uh, the results once a week and, you know, I've been working on web privacy for 10 years, long before I was at Brave. And it's, it's really important to me as something that I can contribute to the world. I'm trying to do something good for the world. Really, uh, it's something that I wouldn't compromise on. And if somebody told me at Brave or anywhere else, you know, you have to change this thing to make some browser look better, something like that, I would, I would never do that. I would, I would actually really uh, be completely opposed to doing that to the point uh, like I would never compromise at all. I think I might have briefly read it, but it doesn't really sink in that you were involved with so many other important privacy projects in this space as well, um, which is really awesome. And um, in addition to that, I think that the one area where people would go, well, because the tests are open source and you can run them yourself. So, I mean, the amount of influence that you can have is pretty limited in this. And I think the largest influence would be the number of like what tests you introduce, which ones you don't, and maybe how they're formatted, um, which we can talk about later. Because um, I, I was going to ask about that anyway, because um, there are some things that I'm curious, like, oh, how come you don't test that? Is it because it's difficult to test? Is it because it's out of scope for the project? Um, so there's things like that that I want to ask about. I did want to ask, was this always open source from day one? And like, what's your testing setup look like? And I'll talk about, well, I'm curious because Jonah and I tried to run the tests and it was kind of screwy back here when we tried. So I'd really be curious to hear oh, how you cool. do the tests. Yeah, so uh, it, it was, I mean, effectively open source. I had it on GitHub from basically day one. Uh, I don't think anybody was looking at it until I, you know, quote, published it uh, on a on its own domain name and announced it on Twitter. Um, but yeah, it's never been closed source. It's always been open source. Um, and that's also really important to me because I want it to be verifiable. I want other people to be able to read the code and decide is, you know, is this testing things the right way? Is there a mistake? And, and people have found bugs. So it's, it's actually really valuable to me that it's, it's open source. Um, and of course I want people to understand that it's objective and they can run the tests themselves in terms of the, the testing setup. Um, Currently, uh, I run the tests on a Mac mini. I chose Mac because it's the only platform where I can run tests on Safari. And that's really important because it's one of the major browsers. Uh, and then in addition to that, that's for desktop. In, in addition, I'm running the uh, mobile tests on an Android phone and on an iPhone. Um, so it's actually all on real hardware that people would use. Yeah, and I think this kind of brings up um, the point I was, I was talking about earlier, which was, so how do you choose what tests to have in privacytest.org? Because um, JavaScript enabled or disabled is not, I don't know why I said dis disabled, <laughs> JavaScript enabled or disabled is not really a test on privacytest.org, nor is something like JavaScript in time, JIT. I guess maybe some things that might be more out of scope, like how, how long does it take for security updates to come in for this browser? But obviously that's not something you can just run as an objective data point. So I guess like, what is the scope of the tool? How come some things aren't tested? How come some things are? What do you, what's the thought process behind the tests that you've decided to implement into privacytest.org? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. So I, um, I started with actually the, the first category of tests at the top are called the state partitioning tests. And I started working on those because those felt like to me the most urgent thing that we should understand is, is going on in different browsers. And it has to do with cookies, which everybody has heard of and are one of the fundamental ways that you get tracked across the web. Um, and then gradually I've been expanding it out. And honestly, you know, a big limitation has just been my time and I've, you know, found it challenging to create some of these tests. So I've just uh, kind of tried to expand gradually and add whatever seemed to be the most important thing that I that I was able to do. Um, there's definitely areas that I, I still want to add and I'm hoping to to be adding in the future. One important uh, uh, constraint is that I, I basically require any testing to be default settings. Um, that is that whatever the browser, however the browser works, when you download it and install it, I don't make any changes at all. Um, and that's important for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that that actually mimics what a lot of users do. Um, a large percentage of users don't tweak privacy settings. And then among those that do, 
uh, they often will do something that actually hurts their privacy because they don't necessarily know uh, the right thing to do. Like I actually don't tweak my own browser because it's better to be, it's better to look the same as other people than to be uh, making s small custom changes to your browser, which makes you stand out from the crowd. M my point of view is that users really deserve privacy, even if they don't know how to change privacy settings, right? Even if they don't know what the meanings of the different privacy settings are. Uh, and so I think that the browser makers have a, a responsibility to be uh, protecting everyone's privacy out of the box. It should be all the privacy protections that they possibly can enable should be enabled by default. So that's why I'm testing it that way. And it's uh, so that's sort of the first reason. The second reason is if we want to make uh, an apples to apples comparison of different browsers, requiring the settings to be on default really helps to make it objective. If I started having to decide, well, I'm going to turn this setting on in this browser versus this one in this browser, it's actually, it's it's an endless, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's a huge number of possibilities that I could, uh, that, I, that I could try. And I'm not necessarily opposed to investigating some of those in the future, but I, I think at least for now, the thing that's really important is to get the, the default settings really figured out. And that way we're really, I want to be putting some, you know, friendly pressure on browser makers that you really need to turn on things by default. And if you're not, then we're going to make that uh, known to the public. That's really important. Right. And uh, I can see that being very difficult because, and that's what I was talking with Jonah about as well, which is, well, even if someone has to go through a setup menu, they might select different things. They might not go through it at all. And it, it shouldn't be your decision to to decide what the average person is going to probably do. Um, and the easiest way to get that objective comparison is to just do everything the same. But not every browser has the same setup menu with the same options. And so it's really difficult and it puts you in a situation where you'd have to start selecting what that the pretty much you're pretty much going to have to start selecting what you're testing for each browser yourself. And then that opens up its new issue as well. I think what would be cool, and this is, again, this is not something that, you know, you mentioned that you're already limited on time. What would be cool is I'm looking at privacy tests right now. And like, let's just say Chrome. Um, let's say you wanted to test Chrome with uBlock Origin installed or something like that. Um, it'd be cool if you could hover over Chrome or Chrome was a drop down menu. And then you had like presets. So like you can drop down and click Chrome with uBlock and then you get like tests with uBlock or like maybe there's a filter above everything. But obviously now you're going to be doing triple the amount of tests or quadruple the amount of tests because you have to do these for for every browser. But um, it'd be cool if like maybe if enough community support wanted to step up and help run these tests or something um, that could be a way to address both sides of the coin there where you're able to give people the default settings. But then people can also be like, well, I want to see what happens if I install uBlock in Chrome or uBlock in Tor. That's a common one because people want to see um, some ad blocking in Tor. It'd be cool to see some of those configurations, but obviously you're just, it, sound, it seems like you're the main person running the, the test. Is that correct? Yeah, it's just me. I think uh, that's a really interesting idea. Um, I, I just, I want to be careful not to give people the sense that the situation right now is okay, because I think it's. I think it's not okay. Like, I don't think browsers by default should be leaking people's data and then saying, well, you know, if you really won't care about your privacy, you can, you can install these seven extensions and change these prefs and so on. Right. I, I think, I think that's, that's sort of upside down. We should really be saying, uh, sure, you can have options, but the default is going to be private. And then if you want to remove privacy for some reason, then you can, you know, we'll give you a warning and you can say you can do this. Right. Just to kind of come back on the question a little bit, just cause I, you definitely touched on the second part of the question, but the first part is like things like JIT, JavaScript and time. How, like, I guess, how do you select, like, cause you, so you mentioned prioritization and things like that. Is that really the main thing prohibiting something from testing like JIT? Cause I know that's something that Safari is, does in lockdown mode, for example. Um, and some other browsers have the option to disable that. And I don't think it's, some people talk about JIT as if it's <laughs> like the number one thing you need to do to protect your privacy and security online. It's a little crazy. It's not that extreme, probably, probably I don't think. Not. Yeah, yeah. But um, I'm just curious behind like, so how come something like that's not included? Is it really just a time thing? Well, that particular one, I I haven't, yeah, I haven't worked on, on investigating the effects of 
I guess, JIT fingerprinting, that kind of thing. A lot of it has been limitations on time um, and basically relevance. You know, I, I'm trying to keep the scope directly to privacy protections and data leaks, that kind of thing. I'm, I'm actually staying away from security um, or performance or any of the other things that people legitimately care about um, in their browser. First of all, I, I really only know about privacy stuff, but also it's, um, I feel like it's been a, a big gap in our, in the public's knowledge um, and a gap in what browsers are taking care of. Like traditionally browsers have actually been, browser makers have been really great about fixing security bugs. You know, they, they work really fast at, at fixing them. They give people big rewards for finding them, right? But if you compare that to privacy, <laughs> like there's no rewards for pointing out that cookies uh, can track people across sites. Everybody already knows it, and it's just left like that. Like that's apparently you know not high on their priority list. So uh, it, for some browsers, so that that's that's my sense is that this is the thing that I want to focus on only. Got it. That makes a lot more sense because um, I I think I even had a question later here, which was like more security oriented things, and I was curious if um, that was even in the scope of the tool. And it sounds like you're focusing more on the privacy side of things. Yeah, it's generally out of scope. I mean, there are some things which are kind of a little bit of both. Like the HTTPS tests do have a, a, a an impact on security, but I'm really f including them because they have a privacy impact as well. Yeah, that really helps me, and I'm sure other people understand which tests you're running, why you're choosing to run certain tests, and why not other ones. I guess some more like less technical stuff. <laughs> so um, how many updates? I think you're at 60. You're at issue number yep. 60 for privacy tests. So of those updates, I'm just out of curiosity, which browsers have been the most fun for you to follow and watch over the course of this project's lifetime? Did any surprise you? I would say, well, what was initially quite interesting was that after I published issue one or the first couple of issues, uh, Brave started working on some fixes because th there were actually several holes in Brave's partitioning uh, protections. Um, and I, they actually contacted me because they had some questions about how some of the tests ran uh, and they worked really hard on, on fixing them. And that's, I think, actually been one of the sources of confusion is that Right now, Brave is passing most of the tests, but that's not because I chose tests that Brave would pass. It's actually the other way around that I published tests and then Brave started fixing it. And you can go back to issue one. There's a little archive uh, on the site and you can see that they were failing more tests previously and, and they fixed them since then. Brave impressed me in that way. Another big thing was that Firefox rolled out a feature called Total Cookie Protection, which is actually something that I helped with when I was working at Mozilla. Uh, but after I left, they rolled it out by default. And that was a big step change in Firefox's privacy because suddenly they were partitioning everything uh, with, I think, one exception, so that it's much harder for websites to, to track you across sites. And, and, and another interesting one uh, is um, LibreWolf, which um, I hadn't really heard of before I started the tests. I added it a bit later, but they had enabled a whole lot of protections that had been created by Tor browser and upstreamed into Firefox, but were off by default in Firefox. So they enabled them by default uh, and they do very well in the tests. So uh, I, I was really thrilled to see a browser that, um, I mean, apart from Tor browser, but one that is like really focused on just turning on as many protections as possible. Um, and it's a, you know, a, a fairly small project, I think, but it's, it, it demonstrates what's possible if you decide to, to you know do the right thing. And as you're talking, you, and this is more, sorry, I'm going back technical, but I'm curious because um, you make it sound like, so you designed these tests to be able to recognize whether or not a browser is properly protecting cookies and partitioning them properly, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. Is your method of testing that foolproof? So what I mean is just because a browser passes your way of testing if it's partitioned properly, does that mean that there's no other way of accessing that data? How foolproof is your testing mechanism? Uh, and this will help me understand also how how these websites even track people. Is there only one way of doing this or are there multiple ways of tracking people via these methods? Right. Well, I, I guess each test, I would say, is pretty narrow in scope. Like each row in the table in privacy tests is, is narrow in the sense that I'm just mimicking one particular way of 
doing cross-site tracking. So the cookies is a, is a good example. There's actually two cookie tests. One is for HTTP header cookies, and the other is for cookies through JavaScript, which is the document.cookie API. But th the idea here is um, when you visit a web page, there could be a third party tracker in the web page and it decides to store a cookie in your browser and browsers are all standard. The standard is a browser will accept a cookie and store that data on your computer. Okay. Now, if you go to another website, the tracker, there could be a tracker in that website as well. If it's the a tracker from the same domain, like facebook.com, for example, it can read the cookie back. And if it, it can then compare the cookies for the two site visits and see that it's the same identifier, the same data. So now Facebook knows you visited these two sites. So it's it's basically, that's how it always works with cookies. There's really just that one way to use a cookie. Um, so all I'm doing is I'm mimicking that little story that I told you. I try, uh, you know, one website, to, I get, a cookie to deposit and then I go to a second website with a different domain I try to read back the cookie and I see if it works or not that's the test there's two ways actually of using cookies that I mentioned so there's two tests there then there's a whole bunch of other kinds of things which work like cookies they're not technically cookies but they could be used or abused to do the same thing that a cookie does when it tracks you across sites and so all of those things need to be partitioned partitioning means that we don't allow data to be shared between websites. Basically, you create a cookie jar for every website you visit and cookies are isolated in that cookie jar and they can't get out. That's how to partition. So for example, there's um, several, there's several uh, caching mechanisms in browsers. For example, the image cache is where images get stored in your browser. When you, when you visit a website, it, it'll store the images that it's showing you. And then if you visit that website again, uh, soon after, like the next day, it may still have those images in the cache. So it'll be able to show you the images sooner that, uh, than it otherwise would if it had to re-download them from the web. But this can be abused to track you because if two different websites are referencing the same image and showing the same image, even if that image is invisible, they can then see, did you already have that image in your cache? traditionally in web browsers. And so if you do, that means that you must have visited the other website. So they, they have now linked your visits to those two websites. Partitioning would say, let's have a separate cache, a separate quote unquote cookie jar for each website. So this can't happen. So each, each of these is a pretty narrow thing, but it is true that there are probably more things than are listed in the tests here. Some of which I'm not aware of that could be abused to track people across sites. So if there are more things, we want to find those and, and test those wherever it's feasible. Um, I, it's a fairly long list. I think it's you know a, a good representative picture, but there's there are probably more things like that. I mean, you can hover over them and it tells you what each test is and what it means, but it really helps to understand how you design these tests and what it's actually testing on each browser. Um, and I think it also kind of exposes how like this is not, I think probably um, designed to be a perfect tool either. It's not supposed to be a everything. Oh, everything gets a green checkbox. Therefore, you're private. So I guess do you want to? And this this is my next question anyway. So this is more of a broad question. But um, tools like privacy tests are never probably going to be perfect. And I think any objective tool, um, which is by the way, what you're doing with your browsers, is what we're doing with VPNs on our website. Which is we just list out objective data points. We used to do reviews. We stopped that. And now we just do objective data points. But the problem with that approach for us and probably a lot of tools like this is how do people even use the data? I feel like two people can look at the data and make completely different assumptions from it depending on their knowledge and what they know. How do you think privacy tests and the data that you're providing to people translates into recommendations for people? How does someone look at this and go, oh, I think based on this data, I'm going to choose this browser versus this browser? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I I'm actually very strict with myself. I don't make recommendations um, because the scope of privacy tests is supposed to be only these objective test results. And you're absolutely right that there are different ways of looking at the data. Uh, and I think that's actually the right way to think about it. That every person has their own 
um, priorities. Some people care the most about the performance of their browser, or some people care about the security. Uh, and so privacy is just one of those inputs. If you're looking for a browser and you care about privacy to some degree, this may be a useful input. And I think you know a qualitative look at the site does give you a sense of which browsers are putting a lot of effort, which browsers are putting less effort into protecting privacy. Um, but you know, I also don't have a score on the site for each um, browser because it's not really possible to weigh the different tests in importance. Some are probably more important than others, but by how much, I actually don't know the answer to that question. It's a little bit also kind of your threat model and your sense of the world and you know what you care about. So for example, you know, you really are in danger from being tracked, like your life is in danger, you may want to weigh the use of Tor higher than if you are just doing run of the mill browsing and you know you want your your privacy protected but if a nation state is after you uh or i mean is able to track you you know you're not in danger that might be a different consideration so th these kinds of things uh are they, they require human judgment and i'm i'm not that's not my what the service i'm providing i'm just trying to provide the data that goes into those judgments i think it's definitely the right approach and again we this is actually the journey that we went through except we did the inverse because we used to do VPN reviews and we used to have a VPN review protocol. And this protocol tried to do exactly what you said you're not doing, which is we tried to weigh what's important. And so we had a whole protocol that we could just put in data for every service and it spits out a number and then we have a number. It was kind of nice for some things because then you can be like, well, we just have a protocol. We put everything through it and here's like a score for people. So if people just want to be told what to do, <laughs> then these are the top five options based on our protocol. And if you trust our protocol, then you can trust the recommendations. And I think a lot of people did like that. But on the other hand, there was always gonna be, you know, a minority or maybe even a majority, depending on the test, that's going to disagree with um, the protocol that's chosen. And so going into the recommendation and the scores is definitely a tricky thing. I think the most you could probably do on your site is like a total tally of check marks. Like, 60 out of 70, Chrome, 20 out of set. Like it's probably the most you could probably do without it becoming a, a conflict of interest is my guess. Yeah, I mean, even that scares me because I, I feel like people would see it as a score, even if it wasn't intended as a score. Um, but you know, I it, it's, it wasn't something that I necessarily anticipated, but I, I actually feel like sticking to just the data has made it more powerful because if I expressed opinions, I think people would start to doubt like, well, where's this opinion coming from? But what I'm trying to do is kind of remove my, my own biases or my own whatever from the equation and say, look, the, the tests are the tests and these are the results that they're getting. Um, and you can look at those tests and decide if they make sense to you and if they're, you know, providing useful information. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to be, completely fair among all the browsers. I have had people, you know, express their concerns about me working at Brave, and I, I actually totally understand where they're coming from. I mean, one of the heuristics we use when we're getting information from other people on social media or wherever is we say, well, what are their connections? What are their interests? What are their conflict of interests? Um, and so, you know, it is a valid question that, that I work for Brave. I mean, it's it's essentially because that's been the path of my career and privacy test is kind of running in parallel and I'm, I'm keeping them separate, but you know, I don't really have a way to absolutely prove that. So the only thing I can do is to say, I'm just going to keep this objective and give, give it to other people to investigate it and, and decide if it's testing the right kinds of things. Right. Well, there's nothing else you can do unless you, I, I don't know, you strapped a GoPro to yourself all day and live streamed it so people can see what you're doing all day because it's open source, it's objective data, and um, you even have like a whole about page detailing this. So like you're, you're transparent and public about it. The data itself is just data. You're not making recommendations and it's all open source and people can verify the tests. I like, I don't know, I can't think of anything else you can do outside, again, just like live streaming your life to people and broadcasting an all your thoughts. Idea. Maybe, maybe I should consider that. <laughs> is that going to be an issue 61? 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> the, li the live video uh, version of privacy tests. I didn't know if I wanted to go here, because um, I think you've already answered the question, but I think like the one thing that would be really cool to see, and because I, I talked about the different scopes and how like 99% of things I would probably ask about that are missing make sense based on the scope that you gave me of this being strictly a privacy tool. I think the one thing that would be really cool to see on privacy tests, and I'm curious why, it's it might be hard to test, which is another thing, I think it'd be cool to see domains contacted by browsers out of the box because that is a default thing and it is a privacy. Oh, yeah. A lot of browsers collect more than they should out of the box, but I also don't know how you'd measure that. Would you just display the domains contacted? Would it be the amount of bytes of data sent? Um, so I guess that's probably where this gets challenging. Actually, I think that is uh, definitely in scope for what I want to do. I haven't done it yet because uh, I just didn't get to that that part of the the work but absolutely i think not just domains contacted but looking at the specific data that browsers are sending home because many of them have what they call telemetry um, and it can be invasive some of it is less invasive um, and so i think there are some kinds of objective measures we can we can make to see to compare those things and that's that's definitely something on my to-do list so. That's awesome. That's good to know. Yeah, that's like the one thing I was like, oh, it'd be cool to see telemetry on this list. And um, so it's awesome that it's on your radar. So I'm excited to see it. I have some general browser questions, especially given your history in the browser space. Um, but before I get to those, did you have anything else you wanted to touch on regarding privacytest.org specifically that you feel like you, you wanted to talk about or you wanted to give feedback on or just any other information? Well, I you know, I love hearing from people. I love getting feedback if people are interested in learning more, I'd be happy to talk on Twitter or email. Um, some people open issues, which is awesome. Some people are, you know, they actually, I've had a couple of pull requests fixing issues with um, different things. So yeah, I, I, I love the community part of it and getting as much um, help and feedback from people as, as uh, is available. I wanted to talk more about just the general browser space and maybe even just you and your relationship with browsers. Um, I wanted to just ask if you're comfortable sharing what browsers do you use? And yeah, it's plural if you use multiple. Yeah, I use, I use multiple browsers. Um, I mean, because I'm working for Brave, I'm tending to use Brave to dog food because I'm, you know, I'm working on some, you know, privacy protections for my day job. And so I, I want to see like, is everything working? Have I broken something this week? You know? And so, um, Probably I, I use that more. I also use, you know, Tor browser. Uh, I've used Firefox a ton because I, I worked on Firefox for, for a, a long while. Um, and because I'm testing, like, uh, of course, I'm doing these automated tests, but in order to sort of cross check those tests and develop new tests, I end up using all the browsers <laughs> because I have to check them all. So I'm relatively familiar with uh, the UI and on all the browsers that I'm that I'm testing on privacy tests by this point. And then um, on mobile? Kind of the same thing, yeah. Um, I, I have done a bit of Android development on Brave, so I was, I've been doing a bit of that. But uh, yeah, I, I use uh, multiple browsers on, on mobile too. Very cool. I also wanted to get some, I don't know what you can share, and you don't have to share anything you're not comfortable with, but I'm kind of curious, and I'm sure other people are as well, behind some of your experience working for Tor and Mozilla. And um, I guess what you developed there, um, how you feel those browsers are, are doing after you've left. Um, I know that there's a lot of people who aren't happy with a lot of decisions Firefox makes, so it'd be cool to get um, any perspectives you have on the browser space in general. Yeah, so just, I guess, briefly, um, I was at Tor for about four and a half years, uh, and uh, Tor, the Tor project is a really small group of people, um, and the, within that, the number of people working on the Tor browser was was really small. Uh, so I worked on all kinds of stuff, mostly privacy protections, but also UI and all kinds of random things. I spent quite a bit of time working on partitioning. Uh, so that's kind of when I learned what partitioning is and how it works. Um, and it was kind of Tor browser that helped to pioneer partitioning. Also Safari was doing partitioning um, early on as well. But, you know, that was one of the things that motivated me to, to do the tests. So yeah, and, and in the meantime at Tor, because Tor Browser is based on Firefox, uh, I was learning the ropes of uh, the Firefox code base. Um, I started to work with a team at Mozilla um, to 
try to move a lot of the patches we had, the, the code changes that turned Firefox into Tor, to move those code changes into Firefox with disabled by default so that Firefox would now be carrying these cool new privacy features that you could turn on. It also helped Tor Browser because then we didn't have to keep re applying these code changes every time something in Firefox changed. So it could just be maintained by the Mozilla. So that got me kind of uh, working a lot with the Mozilla folks. And then at some point I said, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could turn on these things in Firefox? So I, I was lucky enough to get a, a job at Mozilla as a product manager. Uh, and the idea that I had was let's try and push forward some of these privacy protections, we'll polish them, and then maybe we can ship them as features that are either easy to turn on or, or better yet on by default. So yeah, so one of the things I worked on was total cookie protection with a really amazing group of engineers, fantastic people who, you know, they worked for years on this to get this partitioning working. But it, you know, it was challenging to get the thing finally rolled out. Um, you know, there's, at every company, there's different people with different opinions, you know, and so there's, especially in the position like product manager, which is something I hadn't done before, I got involved in lots of debates around, like, what should we ship by default? What should we work on right now? This kind of thing for privacy. Um, so, you know, it, it was definitely very challenging in that respect. Uh, but I'm really happy that that in the end, Firefox did turn it on by default for everybody, both in desktop and mobile. Also at uh, Firefox, uh, I, I worked with another team that um, we, we put this feature together called HTTPS only mode, which basically it's a checkbox. When you turn it on, um, it warns you before you uh, connect to any insecure site. And it tries to make any insecure connection that normally would have been insecure, it upgrades it to a secure connection if possible, and then otherwise it, it warns you. So uh, this uh, seems to have really taken off. It's quite popular uh, among Firefox users. Uh, other browsers are have introduced the same thing, usually off by default, but there are a couple browsers that have it on. Tor browser has it on by default now. And that's actually really important for browsers using Tor because uh, if you make an insecure connection to the Tor network, you are vulnerable to uh, an exit node in the Tor network spying on you or even interfering with your traffic and stealing data from you. Um, so you really need to use HTTPS only mode in, in a Tor network using browser. So Tor browser has it on by default. Brave Tor mode now has it on by default as well. Yeah, and then since then working at Brave, uh, you know, I've been working on more HTTPS related things, some fingerprinting things. And uh, I mean, in general, at all three places, I've been just amazed by the, the talent uh, that people have. And I'm just learning every day from other people, like how to do everything and how, how, how to do this job. So it's, uh, it's actually been an amazing experience. Well, thanks for the inside look. Uh, I'm sure that I know that's not something I've heard before. Um, I don't normally get to hear much about the development that goes on behind a lot of these privacy tools and within browsers, especially. So hopefully that's good insight for other people listening as well. What do you think the future of privacy web browsers looks like? Is there anything that you're excited for? Is there anything that you think is going to be game changing, either a specific feature or a specific browser that you're looking at? Well, I guess my perspective has kind of evolved where what really excites me is uh, when the whole web is private. Like I, I think it's long past time that we fixed these privacy leaks and that web browsers, they, they shouldn't be behaving this way where they leak data. You know, it's been the norm for like 30 years, um, but that's, that's not the, the way that it should be. Um, and I mean, it, it's a really fundamental problem because we have governments and corporations that are spying on everybody, on billions of people. And th this mass surveillance, you know, it's it's going on and, and yet somehow the companies are still acting like it's, you know, they don't need to fix it. Um, so uh, what's really gonna be exciting to me is when, for example, Chrome implements partitioning, that's gonna be a major step forward for privacy. Um, and they are working on it. They have announced that they're gonna be um, partitioning a, a whole bunch of things that are on the those tests um, this year. We'll, we'll see if it, they manage to do it this year or when it's going to happen, but I'm optimistic that they're going to make that that fix. 
they've already um, rolled out uh, some partitioning of network connections, which if you look over the past like three privacy test issues, you can see some changes there. So that's actually, I'm, I'm most focused on, not on the quote unquote privacy browsers, but on the mainstream browsers, Chrome being the biggest and, and Safari being the second biggest as the browsers that in an ideal world, I would help to, you know, give them a little push in the right direction. And, you know, there are other reasons why they're moving in the right direction too. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's what, that's what I'm hopeful for. And I hope that the browsers that I've worked on are helping to show the way, right? Like, you know, Brave and Tor and Firefox are, are saying, look, we were able to partition, for example, we were able to protect against uh, various forms of fingerprinting. So there's no actual technical reason why Chrome and Safari can't do those things. Someone who's watching this, a lot of the people are pretty much all of our audience are, a lot of them are probably pretty into the privacy world. Why, why is it important for Chrome to give better privacy? And it's an important question because a lot of people in the privacy space don't care if the mainstream options get more private and more secure. But why should they care? And why is that something that you're focusing on? The first reason is simply that Chrome has, you know, the majority market share. And if you include browsers that are using the Chrome code base, which includes Edge um, and Opera and Vivaldi, uh, it gets up near 80%. So having privacy protections built into Chrome or to, into Chromium uh, means that we can really protect everybody. And, you know, I'm, I care more about just me and my, my privacy nerd friends. I want everybody to have this opportunity to, to be able to use the web privately. And I think there's also uh, something important about what happens if the whole society has privacy. It means that we have a better chance of having a democratic and free society over the long term, that if a tyrant or would be tyrant tries to uh, abuse all the information they're collecting to, let's say, get rid of our freedoms or, or our civil liberties, um, that people will be able to protect themselves. But if only a small minority of the society knows how to use a private browser and is protecting themselves, that's probably not enough because we all depend on each other, whether or not we're privacy focused or, you know, somebody else. So we, I think there's a kind of a, you know, cooperative effect for the whole society needs to, needs to be protected for this to really work. Right. It's a good perspective to have. And it's a really important thing to highlight because I think a lot of this mentality comes from a, well, I'm private and I'm using privacy tools, so why shouldn't anyone else? If they're not going to understand why this is a big deal, then that's their problem, which is not healthy because everyone being private actually still helps you. So even from a selfish perspective, if other people are more private, it means that like, if, if your mother has your contact in their contacts list and they use Facebook on their phone and they're sharing your contacts list with Facebook, Facebook has your phone number and your first and last name. That's just one out of several examples of why this is important. Your family member does a DNA test. That involves you too. So like these things, everyone else being private also helps you as well. So even from a selfish perspective, I don't understand why people would not want. So I'm, I'm kind of ranting here, but I think it's an important thing. No, to highlight. I, so I'm glad you said it. <laughs> I completely agree. But I think even beyond the selfish perspective, I think most people, you know, they do also care about other human beings, even ones they don't know. Um, and you know, it's, as they like to say, privacy is a human right. It's, it's on the universal declaration of human rights, article 12, that you have the right to privacy. And we, we really should be preserving that because, uh, it has fundamental, fundamental implications for our, I think our survival as a species over the long term. I guess the last thing I wanted to talk about, and I'm, I'm asking everyone this because I want the most amount of information I can possibly gather about it. Apple iOS opening up to different web engines, progressive web apps on Safari now. What do you, what do you, what do you have to give me? What information do you have? I just want any information I can get. So spill. <laughs> I don't, I don't have information on that. I, I, I guess I can give you my thoughts. I have slightly mixed feelings. The, the issue is that actually 
Safari has done a relatively good job, as you can see on privacy tests, in protecting privacy. Um, I mean, it's not perfect, they can do more, but you know, in, in many cases, they have really been the leaders uh, or among the leaders of new privacy innovations. If you look, for example, on the iOS uh, privacy tests page, um, a lot of the browsers do better than they do on desktop, and that's because they are using the WebKit engine. They're, use, they're basing their browser on Safari, so they are inheriting all those privacy protections for free. And I don't actually know the latest news on this, but if it's opened up to other engines, there, that could actually be a step backwards for privacy. On the other hand, I think you know it's good to have, in general, I, I like openness, so I, it's... I'm not really a fan of the walled garden kind of situation that's uh, existed in iOS. So it's basically mixed feelings for me. That makes sense. I think what um, what I hope happens, the browsers that can implement better privacy protections than WebKit will choose not to use WebKit. And the ones that can't do better will just stick with WebKit. Um, so it'd be awesome, for example, for Tor browser to roll out their own version for iOS that's actually a properly official working Tor browser on iOS that's not the third-party Tor browser that's still stuck to WebKit and probably has a million limitations compared to the desktop variant. Um, so it'd be cool to see some of the... It's, it's cool to give the power to more people, but I hope that it's, again, not abused and that... Um, some things don't take a step back because if you look at privacy tests and you see how Chrome performs versus Safari on desktop, if that's now the new situation on iOS, then like you said, that would be a bit massive step back. Well, I just want to thank Arthur for his time and coming on this podcast. I know you have a lot on your plate, especially with your full-time job as well as running privacy tests and you, you know, took precious time out of your day to come here. I want to thank everyone who's tuning in for being on this interview as well. Um, it really means a lot for everyone watching and really getting to learn and get into more nuanced privacy and security discussions. Yeah, that's it. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks again, everyone, for watching. Again, these are independent interviews. Um, no one pays to be here. No one even really normally knows what I ask them going into this interview. So I pretty much just try to have these really just let's talk and figure things out type of interview style um, so that you all can kind of get inside looks into the tools that you probably use. Um, so if you like this kind of interview, um, really the main way that you can keep them going is by supporting us on Patreon. So go to patreon.com slash techlore. We have a lot of fun perks there for you, um, like monthly q and A's for our live streams, so you get to ask me questions for our live streams and I'll answer them. You also get to support us. We have a Signal group chat just for supporters. We also have unique communities in both our forum and on Discord. So really, it's a great place for you to support this kind of open privacy, the open privacy resources that we're building for all of you. And also it lets us uh, give something back to you as well. So if you really like these interviews and what we're doing here at TechLore, check us out, patreon.com slash TechLore. We also support LibraPay as well. That's on our website. You'll find it in the support um, link down below. We also support Monero. We also have merch. We have a lot of other things that we do here at TechLore and lots of ways that you can support us. So Thank you all again for watching, and we'll see you next time on TechLore.